Welcome to part two of Ecology. We're going to focus on biodiversity and the human impact. Starting, put these order in order from least stable to most stable. You could pause the video again, try things out on your own, see how well you do. Least stable would be here, number one, an area of forest plowed and replaced by a field of just one type of plant, the Arabica coffee bean. Only one specific organism, no biodiversity. If one dies, they all die. Second least stable would be all the way to the right. Only one food chain, very low biodiversity. Three would be over here, a little more biodiversity. Because now if the giraffe dies, the lions will still have rhinos to eat. And the most stable, right here, has the most biodiversity, therefore it's the most stable. If one species dies, there are plenty of other species to carry out the role of the missing species. That's why biodiversity creates stability. There are many organisms that could take over the role of others. So the importance of biodiversity. The first big importance is it increases the stability, like we kind of just said. If the sea urchins all die, for example, in the high biodiversity diagram, the sea stars could still eat the snails. They have another alternate food source. And the sea otters, yeah, they lose the sea urchins, but they could still eat sea stars, large crabs, and large fish. Low biodiversity, the giraffe dies, there'll be no food for the lions. Dead, dead. Another scenario, if the lion dies, the giraffes will overpopulate, eating all the trees. No more trees left, the giraffes die. So if you remove the top predator, it kind of causes a whole collapse of everything. Two, a lot of biodiversity, it allows for a lot of gene availability and a lot of variations to be available. And we could use these genes for selective breeding, genetic engineering, also called gene splicing or bioengineering shown on the right. And we could take genes and combine them into other organisms. We could make recombinant DNA. We can make hybrid organisms. So it is very, very good to have all these genes because we could mix and match genes to make all the desired traits we want into one genome, into one organism. Three, a lot of biodiversity increases the variety of genes that could be used as medicine. So having all those genes, there might be some genes in some organisms that per allow great medicinal uh, uses or have great medicinal uses. For example, most of the medicines today do come from nature, but they're maybe tweaked in a lab so a pharma company could put a, a patent on the medicine. But nonetheless, they still come from nature. So we look at the ants the inside their cells and their DNA. They might have a gene for an Alzheimer's cure. The anteater, I know it's like a badger or something, but let's say it's an anteater next to the ant. They have a gene for Crohn's disease cure. The little bush or shrub has a gene for uh, lowering blood pressure naturally. And the tree has a gene for pain blocking. It's not addictive. What if we reduce the biodiversity? We get rid of the trees. People come in, they deforest the area. We lose the trees, we lose their cells, we lose their DNA, the gene for the pain medicine. If the trees are gone, the shrubs who need shade, they can't survive. Remember, interdependency. All organisms in some way depend on each other. We lose the bushes' cells and we lose the gene for lowering blood pressure. The ants are going to have no more leaves from the bushes that they eat. The ants will die. The cells will go with them, and the Alzheimer's cure will go with them. And then the ants are gone, the ant eater, no food, they die, their cells go, and the gene goes. So if we cause species to lessen, we cause less biodiversity due to human interference, we're losing valuable genetic information that could help many people. Another importance, a lot of biodiversity allows for natural biological controls for pests. For example, it's, is it better to spray a field 
blanket the field of pesticides? Is it better to create a genetically modified plant where only the bad insects, if they bite it, they die? Or is it better to find a natural predator to kill a local pest? The answer, spraying pesticides, they're going to kill the bad insects, sure. But the pests that are the good insects will also die. Also, if you spray pesticides, you're, you have a very high chance of creating pests that are resistant or a population of pests that are resistant to all these chemicals. Meaning you'll create a superbug population because only the bugs that are resistant, the few that are, they'll live, they'll reproduce, and they'll pass on their resistant genes. If you genetically modify a plant that kills pests, that's going to cause the plants to make their own pesticide. So that's a great alternative to spraying, but meaning the beneficial insects won't die. Only the insects that will hurt the plant, bite the plant, will die because the plant's making its own poison proteins. But think about this. That's a genetically modified plant. That's a GMO plant, not organic. We eat those plants. So those pesticides will go into our bodies. Lastly, if you have a lot of biodiversity, this gives you a third option. Using a natural predator of the pests to kill or eat them. This is a natural way. You're not spraying chemicals. There's no harm to humans. There's no harm to beneficial insects. It's the best of the three. For example, aphids, they love to just eat your plants. Instead of spraying, instead of genetically modifying a plant, use a beetle, uh, a beetle, a uh, ladybug. Ladybugs love to eat the aphids. It's important to note that if you add foreign organisms to an ecosystem, that does not help biodiversity. It actually hurts biodiversity. It's a, a threat to biodiversity. A new non-native species in a new environment, they're dangerous because they're going to be released from the limiting factors that they usually have in their home environment, meaning they're not going to have the predators or parasites or competition that they used to have. Introduction of non-native species to new environments could push native species to extinction. These species are referred to as invasive species. And how do they push native species to extinction? Well, they're going to have no natural predators in their new environment. Like at the bottom here, you see these murder hornets. They're from Asia, and now they're in the United States. They're killing the honeybees. And honeybees are vital for many plants to pollinate. So it's destroying a whole trophic level in an ecosystem. And that could have resounding repercussions for many other organisms. This big, huge python, they are not normally found in Florida, but they are now. They are non-native to Florida, but they were brought here as exotic pets. People released them into the wild. And now these pythons, they have no predators in this ecosystem. They're eating all the animals around. They're eating the alligators. They're destroying or lessening the biodiversity in this ecosystem. Goldfish, also big invasive species, especially in lakes. People release their goldfish. Oh, we're, we're good. We're done with this pet. Put into a lake. It is ravenous. It will eat all of the plants. It will eat all the fish larvae. It will eat little fish. It eats everything. It outcompetes all the other fishes for their natural resources. That's why they get so big. All these, these three examples show how a foreign species into an ecosystem in which they are not naturally found, how they could destroy an ecosystem. Because... Again, no natural predators. Also, they don't have really many limiting factors really to kind of keep their population numbers low. And they could outcompete the native species for resources like the goldfish, especially, and the python in Florida. They're taking all the alligators' food and killing alligators themselves. So invasive species, not good for biodiversity. So how do we control or get rid of them? Well, if it's possible to eradicate the invasive species, it's going to be difficult. But the best course of action would be go to the homeland of the invasive species. Find their natural predator. 
make sure that hey what do these predators of like the the murder hornet what do their predators eat is it only murder hornets if it's only murder hornets bring that predator over the predators will eat all the murder hornets and once the murder hornets are gone they're not going to have any food and that predator that you brought over on purpose will also die win-win Anaconda, I'd have a hard time thinking of a predator for an anaconda or a python. Uh, goldfish, we can find a predator from their homeland, which is Asia, and we can bring it over to get them out of the lakes. But I'm just going to guess their predator is probably more ravenous than the goldfish. So this does not always work, finding a, a, a native predator in their homeland and bringing it over to get rid of them. Because if their natural predator eats other things... And you bring it over to get rid of the invasive species, you could also introduce a new invasive species to an area. Human impact on the environment. We're going to start with water pollution. We have a nice, happy little ecosystem here. We have some fish. We have some plants. The plants are popping out oxygen in the water, keeping the fish happy, keeping them alive. And above the water, we have farms, lawns, parks, grass areas. And people love to put fertilizer down. Fertilizer or sewage. Sewage is a great fertilizer, like cow manure. And sewage and fertilizers, they're rich in nitrogen and phosphorus. Nitrogen is great for making proteins. It's necessary to make proteins and DNA. Phosphorus is necessary for making DNA. So if you have nitrogen and phosphorus, of course you're going to have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, the basics. You can make any organic molecule you want, just about the basic ones. But there's so much put down on farms and lawns and parks that it washes off into the water. This is bad. Because if you have all that nutrient going into the water, algae producers in the water that float around, they'll begin to grow with using all those excess nutrients to multiply uncontrollably. There's the algae starting to grow. You could have these, you know, green patches of algae, you could have red tides, you could have brown tides, those all refer to algal, algal blooms. If the algae reap starts to take over the entire top layer of the water, they're going to block the sun. The sun can't penetrate. If the sun can't penetrate, the plants can't get their sunlight to do photosynthesis. Therefore, no sunlight means no photosynthesis. No photosynthesis means no oxygen or glucose is going to be made for the plants themselves or for the animals living there. So producers are need, they need sunlight. Producers are so, so crucial to an ecosystem because they provide oxygen and nutrients to animals and themselves. So the plants, they'll die. Animals, they'll die because they can't make ATP because no oxygen or, actually, and not or, and no glucose. That leaves all these little fishies dead at the top no oxygen, the plants are dead. This is known as a dead zone. Little to no oxygen. Little oxygen is known as a hypoxia or a hypoxic environment. Anoxia or an anoxic environment refers to no oxygen. Looking at the air now, air pollution and climate change, let's look at greenhouses to start. Greenhouses, there, the walls, roofs are made of glass. They let the sunlight in, short wave solar radiation, which gets absorbed, and it's going to get re radiated as long wave infrared heat. The glass does not let the heat out, so the heat builds inside this greenhouse. That's why it's called a greenhouse. It's great for year round growing plants. As long as you have sun, heat will build up inside here. The greenhouse gases and the greenhouse effect for Earth is called greenhouse effect because these gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and water, they're in our atmosphere. 
and they act like the glass in the greenhouse that we just saw. They let the solar energy through, and when that's absorbed and it radiates as heat, it's blocked by these gases. That traps heat in Earth's atmosphere. Heat, just a little tidbit, is a measure of molecular movement. In other words, is energy. So the more heat, the more energy. So our atmosphere is getting loaded up with heat. It's getting loaded up with energy. What are some effects this could have? That greenhouse effect, the global warming, climate change effect. What are some impacts this could have? One, sea level rise due to melting glaciers and polar ice. Sea levels rise naturally. They, I forgot the exact measurement, but they rise naturally. And they've done that through Earth's history, all, and it's geologic records of it. But the people have been unnaturally putting extra CO2 into the atmosphere. This is causing more heat to get trapped, causing a slight rise in the temperatures, which could have dramatic impacts. And it's causing ice to melt a little bit faster and sea rises to melt a little bit faster than usual. And most people live near a coast. Civilization started by rivers and water. And it's great for transportation. It's necessary for farming. So most people live near the coast and they're going to have to be displaced. Melting ice is also destroying natural habitats for things like polar bears. This will be harder for them to catch food because their habitat is shrinking. Habitat loss and extinction, extinctions. We just kind of touched on that with the polar bears. But as climate is changing, let's say in 1985, on the, right so on the left side of this picture, we saw that the green birds, they lived you know, from 800 feet to below. The uh, brown or yellow, brownish birds, they lived eh, between 1250 and 800 meters off the ground. And then at the very top of this mountain, you had this bird, the, I don't know, what was that, turquoise? Turquoise bluebird lived right at the top around 1,300 feet because there's maybe a cooler temperature up top and you get warmer as you go down the mountain. But now in 2017 and 2023, it looks like since there's more heat or more warmth, that warm area... The bottom area has gone up the mountain. So maybe the temperatures down here are like 75 degrees. And up here are 60 degrees. And up here are, I don't know, 40 degrees. Well, that 75 degree mark is now higher up the mountain. So these green birds could live further up the mountain at a little over 1,100 feet. The yellow, brown, whatever birds those are, instead of starting at 800 feet, could only live as low as, I don't know, 1,090 feet. But they go right to the top of the mountain now. And what about those blue turquoise birds? Well, their environment, their abiotic factors that they need to survive, they're gone. They're extinct. They're no longer around because they got pushed right off the top of the mountain. So rising temperatures can cause ecosystems and habitats in those ecosystems to change. This is leading to extinctions of species. It also allows new species to enter new habitats, since the abiotic factors might be a little more suitable for them, causing new species and new habitats. It's leading to invasions of invasive species. You're going to have also more severe weather. This is a big one. If you have more energy in the atmosphere, that's going to cause stronger hurricanes, thunderstorms, and blizzards. A lot of people are like, oh my God, it's such a big blizzard. It's getting warmer, right? Oh, uh -huh. yeah. Warmth or heat means energy. So if you have more energy in the atmosphere, you have more rising and sinking air. It's more dynamic, meaning you could have stronger any type of storm. That includes blizzards. You could have more severe droughts, floods, monsoons. You have bigger dips in the jet stream, bringing colder air down to areas like southern Florida. You could have more warm 
uh, air mass is pushing further up into Canada. So more severe droughts, floods, monsoons, higher instances of wildfires caused, which can cause habitat destruction. Again, more habitat destruction. Lakes and rivers, they're drying up, and that causes even more habitat loss. Oceans are also warming up, but they're also becoming more acidic. It's called ocean acidification. Carbon dioxide loves to dissolve in water, meaning oceans, lakes, and rivers, to establish equilibrium with the atmosphere. So if there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, more CO2 wants to dissolve in the water. Things like to dissolve or move from high to low concentration. And when dissolved in water, carbon dioxide increases the acidity of the water. This is going to cause the calcium carbonate shells of crustaceans like lobsters and crabs to become thin because calcium carbonate dissolves in acid. This is causing an impediment to their reproductive success, their safety, and it's really hurting the population of lobsters. Very, very big deal these days. Also, corals. Corals can't deal with this pH change. Um, if you see here, we have normal coral and then we have dead coral. They lost all their pigmentation. They lost all the algae that live in them. Algae have a symbiotic relationship with the actual coral. So more acidic ocean, loss of corals, which is the probably one of, if not the most diverse ecosystem on Earth. So where do these greenhouse gases come from, like carbon dioxide? They come from burning of organic matter, things that contain carbon and hydrogen, things like fossil fuels. So what are some fossil fuels? Fossil fuels, they contain carbon-hydrogen bonds, meaning organisms died a long time ago, and they got buried. They never got decomposed, so the CH bonds were left intact. And land plants that got buried with their CH bonds intact, they became coal. It took about, you know, 250 million years to make. And all dead marine plants, they sank to the bottom. There was nothing to break them down due to an anoxic environment. So their CH bonds get buried with them. And that made all the oil that's around today, about 170 million years ago. So coal and oil are the two big fossil fuels. And when they're burned, they release CO2 into the atmosphere. Fossil fuels, they're also called non-renewable because coal and oil, we just said, took hundreds of millions of years, tens of millions of years to make. We can't just make them at a snap of a finger. They do not get replenished. Once they're done or once they're used up, they're gone forever. They are finite, not infinite. So what can be done to slow the greenhouse gas emissions? Well, there's a few errors on here, but use renewable resources, which include wind power, hydropower, solar power. These are renewable because they're fueled by the sun. As long as you have sun, you'll have wind, you'll have liquid water, and you'll have sun for solar power. So as long as the sun still shines, there these resources will not run out. Let's look at some trade-offs of wind power. Trade-off. There's no carbon dioxide released, and it's renewable. Trade-off, though. It's noisy, it kills migrating birds, it's unsightly, and they could freeze like they did in Texas if it gets too cold. Hydropower. No carbon dioxide, no, it's renewable. Hydropower, though, you need to make dams. This causes rivers to run dry. It causes habitat loss downriver. It slows the speed of a stream or a river. It can hurt the organisms that need that water velocity. So it causes habitat loss, impedes some fishing reproduction. Villages downriver will have no power. That was no water. That happened uh, in China, I think on the, the Yellow River. They just built some dams and anyone downriver was just out of luck. Solar power, this is a good one. They've been really working on this quite a bit. There's no carbon dioxide released. It's renewable. Got it. Great advancements have been made to make them aesthetically look appealing. They look good. Attached batteries can store extra energy. Awesome. 
These are placed on rooftops, so land is no longer deforested. Before these last few years, they used to cut down a whole section of, of trees to put solar panels. They don't have to do that anymore. They put it on roofs, and no impact to the environment really is... There's no real impact on the environment. It's actually really good solar power. And lastly, ozone. This doesn't have to do with global warming, I mean, global climate change. It has more to do with protecting us from harmful ultraviolet radiation. Ozone, O3, is a one-eighth inch thick layer in the stratosphere. It blocks UV radiation from the sun. Why is UV radiation bad? It's radiation. Radiation causes mutations and possibly cancer. So holes in the ozone could cause more UV radiation to get through, causing higher instances of cancer, uh, mutations in your DNA. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more.